Alice Willard is, as many of you know, a professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. You may not know that he, from 1960 to 1965, taught philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Did I get that right? Uh, so, um, and his, among other specialties, I think maybe his writing has been specialized in the area of epistemology. And I just learned today from reading your bio that you translated Husserl from the German into English, which sounds like no small task to me. Um, you could read more about Dallas um, in the biographies, uh, in your book, but the, I wanted to share a few personal things too, as well as mention his books to you. Um, the Divine Conspiracy, if you don't have it, you really should. Um, let me just... Sweetie, you've read it three times now? Yeah. Yeah. Richard Foster says in the foreword, The Divine Conspiracy is the book I have been searching for all my life. Like Michelangelo's Sistine Ceiling, it is a masterpiece and a wonder. Um, the Spirit of the Disciplines, Renovation of the Heart, and I want to say how neat it is. I just noticed, Dallas, I, the cover of The Divine Conspiracy. Authors don't always get great covers, but I think you've gotten some great covers because there's a theme here. The Spirit of the Disciplines has a um, plant of some sort, and then The Great Omission has this neat um, cherry tree. And I just thought it was so fitting because uh, it seems like, well, the subtitle is Rediscovering Our Hidden Life in God, and he's really getting into the hidden things beneath the surface, the relationship, our relationship with God, the connection between roots and fruit in our lives. And so um, I highly recommend these books to you. A few happy memories with Dallas, I'll just mention. Uh, one was a walk from a, a funny, a neat restaurant out in the countryside outside of Oxford called The Trout has anyone eaten at the trout? <laughs> you have, maybe, okay. With um, Kirsten Johnson. And um, I was in a season of both Lyme disease and heartbreak at the same time, which is not a combination I recommend to anyone. <laughs> and um, it was just a very comforting two-mile, whatever it is, walk uh, with Dallas talking to both of us. And, and thank you for that, um, encouraging us to live forwardly and that we have eternity to work things out. And then I remember a story, I, I found myself quoting or telling stories about Dallas maybe more than most uh, Veritas forum speakers in Finding God Beyond Harvard. I can't believe I'm quoting Dallas Willard again. This is getting embarrassing kind of thing. And But one of my favorite was a story. He was at a faculty club, and I can't remember which, doing a seminar of some sort. And, and a professor at the end of Dallas's talk, I think it was on the brilliance of Jesus, raised his hand and he said, let me get this straight. You, Dallas Willard, you know, prodigious scholar in philosophy um, and epistemology, the theory of knowledge, and so forth, you're, you're saying that, that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and the one you're following and believing? And there was a sort of pregnant pause. And Dallas looked at him and said, who else did you have in mind? <laughs> at which the professor was appropriately silent <laughs> and then the last story I'll mention is of Ohio State University um, the grand the big ballroom Veritas events 19 oh gosh no like 2002 900 students um, this the MC was this um, great like senior here this just fun loving kid who skateboarded in do you remember this down the main aisle of the ballroom and just did this like cool jump up onto the stage with his skateboard it would have wiped me out you know but he would there he was up on the stage and um and he got instead of the ohio chant he got 900 kids chanting vera Toss, Veritas. It's not very catchy, but Veritas, Veritas. <laughs> and it was loud, and, you know, t the roof was shaking and very funny. And uh, Dallas was introduced, and he came up to the microphone and calmly looked out at the crowd and said, this may be the first time most of you have chanted in Latin. 
<laughs> At that, I introduce Dallas Willard. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Those are lovely memories. <laughs> and uh, it's just wonderful that we get to live this life. And uh, I'm thankful to be here, thankful to be with all of you, to renew not just knowledge of InterVarsity, but the spirit of InterVarsity, which I feel so deeply in these songs and prayers and reading scripture. I almost was in a state of shock yesterday morning to hear two full chapters of scripture read and read so remarkably well. And um, the singing and actually sang all of the verses. <laughs> the and uh, when we got down to the last... We got down to the last one. They omitted the second verse, but then added two more. <laughs> I thought that was just wonderful. I really uh, praise God for the opportunity to be with you. Now, my subject has been assigned to me, and I like that. Uh, and my subject is, in fact, spiritual formation in the academy. Spiritual formation in the academy. And um, uh, this song that we just sang, uh, I hope we could sing that again on uh, Wednesday morning, uh, because I want to raise a question about this, uh, and that is whether or not uh, what is given to us that God has spoken is in the domain of knowledge. No, since I've... I've already been outed as an epistemologist. Let me tell you that that question is probably the most important question I can talk to you about in terms of spiritual formation in the academy. Because you have been positioned as someone who has a lot of stuff going that is in a different category from knowledge. And we want to talk about that, especially on Wednesday and Thursday. Let me give you the four talks, the topics that I will be covering. Um, and they're going to blend spiritual formation um, and the academy. And there's no place where it is more important for us to talk about spiritual formation than in the, the academy, because the academy is now the magisterium of our culture. That is, it is the teaching instrument of our culture. It is in a curious relationship with media that also occupies that role, but not officially. The universities are officially the magisterium of our culture. And that's where you live, and that's where you work. So we, we're going to talk a lot about that, but we just start out with spirituality and Christian spiritual formation. That's for today. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And then, um, I hope you can read like that because I can back a trailer and a truck up a narrow alley, but I can never get these things straight. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to talk about discipleship and spiritual disciplines tomorrow morning. And uh, we'll be laying a foundation for the last two as we go along. Um, and then 
The third talk is Christian Teachings Banished from Knowledge. That's where we stand today. The effect on spiritual formation, which is huge. And I'll try to make that clear as we go along. So that's the third talk. And then finally, the disciple in the world, the fields of knowledge. I was, I sometimes use the title for that talk, The Disciple in the Knowledge Factory. <laughs> but actually, it's no longer a knowledge factory, it's a research factory. That's one of the interesting things that has happened in the prog progression that we'll be talking about. You don't have knowledge universities, do you? You have research universities. And that shift is extremely significant for what we're going to be doing. So uh, those are the topics now, and I'm going to talk for a certain length of time. And uh, at present, uh, that length is uh, not very long, <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, so 10.40, and we'll have 10.40? Yeah, OK. We've got 30 minutes. So I'm going to move right along with this, and I'm not going to attempt to be inspirational, but instructional. Uh, forgive me, but uh, I, I don't think that I can do those two together, and I really want to be instructional. I want to try to help us understand some things, uh, and I, would, I hope that will be inspirational, but it might not be. So now let's start out with a picture of spiritual formation in the New Testament. So would you just write down Romans 5, 1 through 5, and 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 1, especially verses 5 through 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, Romans 1 through 5. So here we go. The Romans passage is in the passive mode, because when you read it, you will get the impression that this is just something that happens. The uh, Second Peter passage is in the active mode, because in it you're told what to do. Right? And it's extremely important to keep those two modes together because they're both essential. So here we go in Romans. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we evangelicals often just put a period there and start preaching. But the period doesn't fall there. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. So now if we had time this morning, you'd, you'd want to stop at each one of those stages, exulting. That's a part of the deal, okay, in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in tribulations. How about that? Tribulations are otherwise known as troubles. Troubles. That's an essential part of spiritual formation. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Now we're getting into character, folks. We've moved from states to character. Perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. I thought we already had hope. We got hope again. Because one of the things that happens in spiritual formation is these things change their character as they move into character. Now we have hope in a way that we didn't have hope before. And it moves toward the wholeness of life. Note the next verse. And hope does not disappoint because 
the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that is given to us. Now, when you read these progressions that show up in various ways in the scriptures, you will always find that agape is the top. Colossians 3, after listing the stages, calls agape the bond of perfectness or completeness. It always shows up at the top. Because it is total Christian character. Now, Second Peter, and you'll note now that this is put in the active. And I don't want to take time to read the first verses in the chapter, but I hope as you rethink this, you will do that because they are very important. But let's begin at verse 5. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence. How much diligence is that? That's all of it. (laughs) You don't leave out any diligence. Did you notice that now we are in the very active mood as we look at this? In your faith, my version reads, there are difficulties with getting the prepositions right here. In your faith, supply virtue or moral excellence. To your faith add, your version may say. Now, who's going to do that? You're going to do that. You're going to add virtue, erite, moral excellence to your faith. And to your moral excellence, knowledge. Add to your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance, again, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, Philadelphia, and your, in your brotherly kindness, agape. The agape is the capstone. It's the capstone of spiritual formation. Now, it would be wonderful if we had time to talk about how you do each one of those moves. And I don't have time to do that because I want to make sure that we've got the overall picture right. But you might want to begin thinking about how you would add knowledge to your virtue, for example. That's a good step. And what that would mean. And uh, notice that it does say knowledge for later purposes. And actually, a lot is said about knowledge in this first chapter of Second Peter. So keep that in mind as we go along. Now, today's spiritualities. We had uh, some discussion from Tom Sunday morning, very helpful about spiritualities. Because spirituality is now a big issue in our culture. Hmm. And today's uh, spiritualities uh, all promise two things that are in desperate need and short supply. They promise identity and power. Identity and power. They tell you who you are. And they tell you what you can be empowered to do. Now, if you will just listen for those things, you will hear them. Uh, If you can endure watching Oprah, uh, you will see that she's constantly talking about spiritualities and that they offer you those two things. Who are you and where can you get power to live by? And uh, that was uh, outstanding when feminism was a much more lively movement. You may remember a song that went out something like, I am a woo man, right? And then goes on to tell you all the things that I can do as a woo man, right? And that's, uh, you, all the spiritualities offer you, offer that. And that's why they are in such desperate supply now. 
and uh, Satan worship, spirituality. Wicca, paganism, spirituality. Now, if your campus is like mine, when they have a meeting of the religious groups, Wicca shows up. Paganism shows up. They're not, they haven't quite moved to Satan worship yet, but if a Satan worshiper showed up, they would have to accept that or be sued. See, that's, that's where we are. It's a spirituality too, right? And uh, why shouldn't Satan have a voice? Now, these cannot be found Uh, looks like in the human being in physical reality they can't be found in physical you cannot find identity and power for the human being in physical reality you can't find it in the world of sensation and natural abilities but that is where human beings try to find it when they're apart from God and that's the story of Romans 1 that's why when the mind turns away from God, it turns to idols. And today we live in an idolatrous society. We live in a society that worships material, sensual reality. That's, that's what we have. Sensuality is what Romans 1 is about. And, of course, covetousness is idolatry. And who is the God of the covetous person? C'est moi. I'm the God. That's what covetousness is. It is the assertion of myself as supreme. You have something I, I like? Well, I should, I should have that. That's what I'm thinking as a covetous person. So Paul says, the mind of the flesh, that is the mind that is set on the natural, is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. See, the human mind always stretches beyond the natural. As Descartes says, the human will is infinite. You cannot satisfy it. And it will ruin you if you try to. Uh, because you will never find satisfaction and you will reach for more and more. The well-known rock song, I Don't Get No Satisfaction, is the um, anthem of the mind of the flesh. Right. So... Uh, this we want to keep in mind about spirituality in general. Uh, spirituality is an, you cannot eliminate it from human life simply because the human being is built to live beyond anything that it com can command from a natural point of view. And the infinite yearnings of the human soul drive it to spirituality. It cannot be satisfied within the natural. Uh, some religions and philosophies try to do that. Buddhism is one and Stoicism is another. And what they decide is desire is the problem, so get rid of desire. Right? And if that's all you got, you're probably better off there than you are being hounded to death trying to satisfy your desire. Now, we want to define our terms carefully. We start with what is spirit. What is spirit? We're, going, we're talking about spirituality and spiritual formation, so it's important that we have an idea of what spirit is. So I submit to you this statement. Spirit is unbodily personal power. Unbodily 
personal power. Now, coming at that as a Christian, of course, we start from God, who is spirit. What is God? Well, a lot of things, but he is unbodily personal power. Now, to say it's unbodily is not to say it has nothing to do with body, but it is to say it is not dependent upon body. And that's true of the little element of spirit that you have in you, which is your will or your heart. That's your spirit. Spirit beings have. We are spiritual beings uh, in a larger sense, but that's the heart of the matter. So God is spirit, and he is the father of spirits. And when the New Testament speaks of that, it's speaking of you and me. We are spirits in our essence, in our core. And God is spirit. And his being depends only on himself. Only on himself. That's why when Moses says to him, who shall I say sent me? He says, tell them I am that I am. Now, your translations will struggle with Exodus 3.14. And they come up with some actually pretty dumb things, like, I am what I am. Everything I am what it is. <laughs> yeah. Even Papa says, I am what I, I am who I am, you know. Everything is that. This thing here, or a sheet of paper, is what it is. That's not the point in that passage. The point is... I am that I am. That is, my being is dependent only on my being. Now, God is the only one for whom that is completely true. But he has given you something called will that has an element of that character, and its function is for integration of your life into God's life. The basic function of the human will is to rely upon God. Now, once you get that in place, then a lot of other things follow. And the human will, apart from God, is set to achieve power through integration with natural means. And that's where we get things like electricity and atomic power. See, that's a part of God's intent is that human beings should have power far beyond themselves, but only under him. So Genesis 1.26, which is part of what was read, let us make man in our likeness and let him have dominion. That's the image of God in the human is dominion. If you don't like that word, use responsibility. Uh, It's about the kingdom of God. You have a kingdom or a queendom, if you like that better. Uh, And that's God's provision under your will. And his intent was that you should bring that under his kingdom. And then the limitations would expand, uh, limitations of power would expand depending on your character. Did uh, did you know that uh, you are greater than John the Baptist? Did you know that? If you don't know that, read Matthew 11, 11, think about it, and try to figure out what that means. And in the context, you'll see, I think it means returning uh, to the kingdom of God. Now, negatively, spirit is just non-physical, and it's used that way. Uh, And... When you hear spirituality talked about in the popular culture today, it will very much have to do just with uh, not physical. That's what Oprah means when she talks about it. But the secular mind is set to make spirit something that is derivative from the physical or the natural. And so now you have secular spirituality because no one wants to be left out, right? 
and just be an old materialistic drudge. Now, spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is a process. It is the process through which um, the human spirit takes on a definite form or character. Okay. Now that's not stated in terms of Christian spiritual formation. We're coming to that next. But it's very important that you understand what spiritual formation in general is because everyone gets one. Spiritual formation is like education. Everybody gets an education. It's just a matter of which one they get. The gang member has had spiritual formation. You can't avoid one. And the standing human problem is to solve the difficulty of making human beings turn out right. Uh, Plato's Republic, a famous book, it's entirely devoted to spiritual formation. You look at the process in that book, that is, they're trying to work that out because they're, at that point they're coming out from under mythological understandings of human well-being and they're trying to devise something that can take the place of the ritual and mythological structure of traditional societies. That's what Plato is all about, really. And in the Republic, he's trying to explain how you could set up an educational system that would turn out good people in a good society. See, it's called a Republic because it is talking about... um, The other day I set one of these and I heard it going off and I thought, hmm, someone's timer's going off. (laughs) But I have an extension of 10 minutes now, so. I'm sorry? Okay, (laughs) that's even better. (laughs) Better than a timer. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But Plato, you see, and that's the standing problem. Like in our culture today, mention a problem and the answer is education. All right? No matter what education. Now you see that would be true depending on the education. I mean basically the answer is right, and the only question is, well, which education are you going to get? And right now we're getting one that if it does anything, forms the spirit in a harmful direction. And many like in our school system out in Los Angeles, 50% of the students drop out before finishing. And the ones who stay in come out, by and large, disabled for life. The greatest social injustice in our country today is what happens in our education. That's the greatest social injustice. Because... It's basically right to say the right education would solve the problems. Right? So you have someone in our country who lives in very poor conditions and so on. If they simply received the proper moral formation, with very few exceptions, they would pull out of their unfortunate circumstances. Best thing you can uh, say to a person who is in trouble financially is... Don't do anything wrong from here on. Do what is right. Be truthful. Be honest. Be occupied with what is good and helpful and loving to people. And basically in our country, anyone who does that will be pulled out of their other difficulties. But how do you get them there? So everyone gets a moral and spiritual formation. Uh, Hitler as well as Mother Teresa. See, they they had a spiritual formation. Now, Christian spiritual formation, um, this is Christian spiritual formation. It's 
the Holy Spirit driven process that forms the inner dimensions of the human being or self in such a way that they become like or take on the character of the inner dimensions of Christ himself. Okay, now I'm going to spell that out, but you want to try to hang on to that. You can see that basically this is spiritual, this is still spiritual formation. But what is Christian spiritual formation? Well, it is the spirit-driven process that forms the inner dimensions of the human being or self in such a way that they become like the inner dimensions of Christ himself. Okay, so now what are those inner dimensions? Well, actually, Christ himself gives us a little help with that. Uh, you all know what he said in Mark 12, or is it Mark 10, where he is asked by a lawyer, um, what is the great law? Mark 12, verse 29 and following. Mark 12, 29. And what did Jesus reply? He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Five dimensions. Five dimensions. Are we agreed that Jesus probably knew what he was talking about? Would you think that he left out some important dimension? I wouldn't think so myself. So let me try to represent this now with a diagram. And I hope you can see that. If anything that I put up here that you can't get, uh, they're here and you're welcome to look at them uh, when I'm done. But these are the dimensions of the human self. Now, you live in a system which likes to say there is no such thing as human nature. Okay, let me just tell you, this is human nature. Acorns don't have those. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts have a different nature. Squirrels have a number of those. But they're different, and then there is a dimension which the squirrel does not have, which is called will or spirit. Now, squirrels act, but they don't choose. And I know that we can get into a long discussion about all of this, and perhaps you want to say something. And you're welcome to come up to me at any point while I'm here and straighten me out. Okay. Seriously, I'm, I'm here to learn as well as try to teach. But I just address this head on because it's now fashionable to say there's no such thing as human nature. And that's designed to avoid ideas such as biology as destiny and so on. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, transgendering has now come to the point to where there is the suggestion that there might be several other genders than the ones we know. And this is being written into your law and into your sexual harassment programs, which you may have to take. Um, see, there's, you want to understand that what you're looking at when you hear this about no nature is the excessive extent to which the idea of freedom is driven by desire. And I don't have time to enlarge on that, but that's, what, that's why we're in the situation we are. Now, just think about those for a moment. The center is the spirit. It is the executive center of the self. Uh, it's where you determine courses of action its function, basically, as I say, is to trust God. When it turns away from that, it turns in on itself, and the individual becomes God. 
and willing becomes a project of its own, will for will's sake. And that is where we find ourselves in much of our society, that freedom is an absolute and pleasure is usually taken to be what freedom aims at. So you have two absolute values, freedom and pleasure. Now, sometimes people try to call pleasure happiness, but they're not the same. But those are the things that are unquestioned values around. The mind is your capacity to think and to feel, to represent things and to have feelings. It is a primary condition of willing. If you're going to will, you have to have a thought of something and an impulse toward it or away from it. And that's a part of what goes into the squirrels have that, I think. Very limited. <laughs> your, body, your body is the little power pack that you have to live out of. It's given you as the primary place of your activity. When you were born, the first task you have is to begin to get mastery of your body. And if you master that well enough, you can extend your power gradually outward until the point where it comes where you might be in a position to push a button and blow up the world. See, but it's, you, you have to have a body to push the button. And the body generally runs life without thought. And that's the source of much of our troubles. And spiritual formation is very largely a process of bodily transformation. Now, we're going to come back to these and talk about them tomorrow. I'm just trying to get them in front of you now. The soul, the social is obviously the area of relationships to others. In the fallen world, it's dominated by withdrawal and attack. Withdrawal and attack. And that's what you see going on in normal human relationships among human beings in a fallen world. And that, of course, has to be transformed. Uh, and it's largely a bodily function. Peter's denials are beautiful illustrations of the body and the social context because when the occasion came down he did not consult his mind or his feelings he just blurted out a denial and that's because that's what was in his body in that social context and then the soul is the part of the human being that puts all the others together to make one human life and the, and the reason why life is so disrupted in most people is because there's a broken soul in some degree. The general formula of the broken soul is the things I would that I do not and the things I would not that I do. So you don't have a whole life. And we talk about integrity, see, because the soul is designed to in integrate or bring integrity to the whole life. It cannot do that unless the spirit is counting on God. That's the only way that harmony can be brought to all of these parts. Otherwise, they'll be going in all kinds of directions. You will not have a whole life. You will not be able to do the good things that you want to do. The commands of Jesus will be beyond your reach because of the chaos that is dominant in your life, more or less in the social or in the emotional or in the representational or just in the bent of the will or perhaps in the depths of the soul. So when we talk about spiritual formation now, see, we're talking about all of those dimensions and the process whereby they take on the character of these dimensions in Jesus Christ. I'm very concerned that we understand that. That's what spiritual formation is. And when there is a harmony there, then actions come out of that whole system. They're not just dependent on the will, but on the whole system. You, know, you say, why did I do such and such? Well, there's an answer. Jesus says, bless those who curse you. How do you get there? Well, you have to get the cursing out of your body and out of your soul 
and get blessing in there so that instead of, as is common, when someone is cursed, they curse back. When they curse, blessing comes back. See, now you can't do that by trying to do that. See, if you want to do the things that Jesus says, what you do is you become the kind of person who would naturally do them. And that is the process of spiritual formation. So it occurs to disciples. You learn that by discipleship. Spiritual formation is the process that occurs to people in the position of a disciple. A disciple is someone who is learning from Jesus. And you can stop there a moment and just see that's a disciple. Learning from Jesus how to live their life in the kingdom of God as he would. See, the general, the, the general idea of keeping the law, if you want to keep the law, don't try to keep the law. Try to become the kind of person who would keep the law. And that's spiritual formation. And I've now come to the end. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. No, no, this, uh, this is... This is what I wanted to get said to you today, and I'm going to pick up on discipleship and disciplines uh, in the morning. I'll just ask if Friday six any suggestions or questions. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, and yes, and yes. <laughs> yes. Well, generally speaking, if you ask anyone on the street, should people be happy, they will say yes. If you ask them, should they be free to do what they want, they will say yes. Now, there will be, you'll occasionally meet someone who knows the problems that come with that. But basically, uh, in our culture, where everyone, everything is thought to be relative, those are not. That's what I mean by that. You, you go on a, school, a fourth grade school ground and ask the kiddies, should people be permitted to do what they want to do? They will tell you without hesitation, yes. And you say, should, uh, should uh, people do what is fun? See, again, that'll just come forth. Now, there are always exceptions to generalizations like that. I, I think in the academy they're not, they are uh, questioned, but they are also practiced generally. I mean, you will find some people who in their education they've read something that has alerted them to the problems. But generally speaking, I find that my colleagues pursue happiness and freedom. Right back of you. Right. That's right. So a plant has a, a, a plant has a soul. That is, it has a principle of integration of all of its aspects, its life, into one life. A plant doesn't have a spirit, it doesn't have a mind. When you come to animals, you're making progress there. They have a little bit of a mind, and uh, I don't think any of them have a spirit. But, uh, see, I know that it's important for us to be open in the discussion about this. Uh, so what I think is we notice these different dimensions of the human self, and then we try to see how they might fit together. The soul is like, uh, I mean, you have to talk about it metaphorically because actually it isn't accessible to introspection. You have a sense of it. And it's kind of like an inward flow of life that ties the pieces together. Uh, I use a mechanical metaphor sometimes like a timer on a dishwasher. The timer on the dishwasher takes all of the various capacities of the dishwasher, integrates them together in such a way that dishes get washed and not thrown about and left dirty or in pieces. Uh, so it's that integrative function of the soul. So that's more of a Greek sense now, like when Jesus says, don't be afraid of being destroyed by the soul. 
soul is often used to refer to the whole person, uh, though it's not. We talk about saving souls, but you don't. You save persons, and you don't leave the person there and take their soul to heaven. Um, the reason we do that is because the soul is so fundamental to life as a whole, so much so that we even speak uh, of it in the second person, the Psalms, for example. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? And that's because the soul has a, it runs on its own. You can intervene in indirect ways, and that's actually what spiritual disciplines do. Also, the verse that was read, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring or converting the soul. The, the good shepherd restores the soul. And uh, that's really important to understand when we're talking about uh, spiritual formation. Gentlemen in the back, and then we'll come back up here. You're the gentleman in the back. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I didn't want to say that because I didn't want to be in the position of selling books. But uh, the circle diagram is in the renovation of the heart, and the and this other diagram is too. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. That's one of the, that, that would be a limitation on your education, right? Uh, now, at the bottom of the human being, uh, in terms of, of their choices, is, of course, their will. And you can't coerce that, but education supposedly would have some connection with their will. Uh, you might find a person who is so uh, degenerate that, that they couldn't respond to knowledge, and we actually accept that now in our culture because we generally believe that life as a whole is irrational and doesn't run on knowledge. But that I want to say, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about knowledge, that is because we have a very weak version of knowledge. Just to illustrate that, for example, when I give tests, I like to ask the students, did you believe what you wrote down? And they always look at me kind of funny. You know, by that time, they're used to me being funny. So, But they know you don't have to believe it, much less know it. Right? All you have to do is get the answers right. Now, education in terms of getting the right answers has almost no effect on the will. Knowledge is quite a different thing, and we underestimate its power in relationship to the will. There are still problems because we are twisted by our lives of rebellion in a world of rebellion. But basically, when you understand what knowledge is, you see that there really is a connection that might make the Socratic optimism, as it is called, Socrates, was thought to say that if you knew the good, you would do it. Uh, if you understand what knowledge is, you might think that could be true. But see, what we present now is not really knowledge. Generally speaking, it's the right answers. And uh, we are really troubled about this in our religion because here too we have a great gap between performance and profession. That's well known, isn't it? And we need to try to understand why that is there. And it may be there because we're not really dealing in terms of knowledge at all. And today people don't understand what knowledge is, much less have much of it. This gentleman here and then this lady. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Well, you uh, own that body. And uh, your choices, in some measure, govern what that body does. And in addition, it governs the condition the body is in. And uh, so you have some direct and indirect power over your body. You are not your body. You are a spiritual being in the sense of non-physical, but you are also identified by your body. You get individuated, to use philosophical language, by your body. That's why when people want to know who you are, they ask who is your maternal grandmother or something of that sort. Where were you born and when? And that's how they had, our identity is tied. And in eternity, I will still be the son of Mamie and Albert Willard. Because that's me. That's my identity. I will never lose that. So our bodies are very important, and that's one reason why there's a resurrection of the body. Because it has to do with the wholeness of our personality. But now the thing is, your body also has the capacity to run on its own and do things you didn't want it to do. So now the problem of spiritual formation in relationship to the body is to bring the body in subjection to the spirit and to bring the spirit in subjection to God. Yes, ma'am. Right. Right. So are you, it seems to me that the mind is the censorship. The mind what? The mind uh, is the censorship, the very core. Rather well, than the core. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, the mind is your capacity to think, we can spell that out, and to feel. It has both of those. Now, Many people don't know they have a will. They think actually their feelings are their will. And often their feelings are dominated by their ideas and their thoughts. And so they are locked in until they hear the word of God that comes to them and gives them some new ideas. Aha, uh -huh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. New idea. All right? Now... Uh, if you think that you have no capacity of will other than your thoughts and your feelings, you'll be paralyzed. And that's where many people are. And for example, in the academy, one of the things that is least accounted for is choice or will. There is thought to be no explanation in terms of will. It's all in terms of causes. They're locked into thought, feeling, body, social relationships, and that's your life. Now, the will acts off of these other factors, but it has an independent power on its own to make a difference. And actually, one of the first freedoms is where you put your mind. And that's why Paul uses that, be, renew, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, so here I am now, and that's, this gets us back to education in a way. And uh, I have uh, various desires and thoughts. Uh, and uh, I realize that I can't satisfy those in the way I've been thinking about it. And so I begin to redirect my mind. And uh, if I am blessed, some good evangel comes by and lets me know that there is actually a kingdom of God. And that I was made for it. I like to begin a conversation sometimes with unsuspecting people by saying, how are you doing with your kingdom today? And uh, it's, a, it's really quite interesting to watch how people respond to that. Because they sort of know they've got one, but they hadn't called it that quite yet. Still, they're probably caught up in ego is egotism and, uh, you know, where egos I go and uh, all that sort of thing. So they live like that. But they're, so you give them a new idea. Hey, there's another kingdom. You can live there. So that's 
we, the first freedom, as I say, the person who begins to wake up and look around is where they put their mind. Then the relationship to that, to feelings, is important because you can't control your feelings directly. You can control your thoughts to some degree directly. And then they will transform your feelings. And that begins to form a new matrix out of which you can choose. And that will allow you, if you follow on, to be transformed and not conform to the world. If you don't get caught up in that, working these things by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, you are locked in. You are dead in trespasses and sins. The course of this world will eat you. The devil has got your ideas in his grip and he can take a nap because you're going to run his way anyway. Right? Satan primarily works with ideas. And that's why the work you do is so important. Now, I must quit because if we don't, we won't get back to Mary Poplin. And I am just so anticipating hearing her talk. So I think we'd better quit, don't you? Thank you.